So good afternoon or good morning, everyone, uh, depending on which time zone you are uh, presently. Um, uh, thank you for coming to this uh, uh, webinar number three of the uh, working group two um, uh, as part of the um, GLITS cost action. So the GLITS cost action is dedicated to globalization, illicit trade, sustainability and security and I'm leading uh, working group two, uh, which is focused on platform and uh, the governance of illicit trade. And my name is Daniel Herrera. I am working at the National Defense University in Rome and I am um, a professor of international relations. So I'm very, very happy that we can uh, we are hosting uh, this uh, webinar today on this very, very important topic, which is um, one of the uh, priorities uh, in the coming years of our working group too, uh, which is the cocaine industry, governance, territory, and violence. I'm chairing and I will also very, very briefly uh, discuss. And we have uh, three uh, presenters, three uh, distinguished speakers and friends, and I'm very, um, very uh, grateful to them for uh, um, for for joining this webinar. Also, I'm particularly grateful to Zora Hauser for organizing everything. So she organized and she thought about all these uh, uh, webinar structures. So we have Gustavo, Gustavo Duncan uh, uh, from uh, AFA University in Medellin from Colombia, uh, Zora Hauser of University of Oxford and Emilia Dios, University of Oxford as well. And I'm reading in the exact order of their own presentations. So uh, the, the structure of this webinar will be uh, the usual we have. So we have the three presenters. And uh, so we agreed um, you have about 15 to 20 minutes each. So please don't go uh, beyond uh, if it's possible. Uh, um, I, I, I usually don't like to, to stop people. So please, I, I won't. So <laughs> take take uh, uh, the, your time if it's possible uh, to stay in the schedule. And then I will very, very briefly uh, uh, share some reflections with you in my role of discussant, as I've been asked to be a discussant. And, um, well, the cocaine industry and the dr drug trafficking was also one of my, um, is still one of my research interests. I worked mainly in the past for uh, my PhD dissertation uh, several uh, years ago, and uh, one of my field work was in Colombia as well. Uh, so in uh, uh, Medellin and Cali and Bogota for uh, uh, talking to people connected in various ways uh, to the uh, to drug cartels. And so I very look forward to um, to this discussion. Uh, so I immediately give the floor to Gustavo uh, for sharing the screen and talking to us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Daniela. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here is, is are you uh, see the presentation? Yep. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to, uh, my presentation is called the governance of production and trade, a comparative analysis of the Colombian industry. Um, I wonder if uh, uh, if the drug business of free market. On the one hand, criminal actors buy and sell within and across borders, coming together in temporary coalition while competing with another in a similarly fluid and a flexible marketplace. But on the other hand, it is possible to exert that participation rights and market conditions are regulated, regulated and protection is offered at different state of the supply chain. Uh, this article explores the, mechan the, the mechanism by which drug production and trade can be governed and the settings in which just governance does not take uh, place. Uh, our uh, one of those, uh, uh, assumptions and our argument is that drug trafficking is a business that depends, uh, depends a lot on power uh, transactions. Uh, those with uh, coercive power govern the business. Either authorities and or um, and or organ or armed organization, they enforce participation and property rights, market conditions with price, quantity for payment, and so on, and protection. Uh, they reduce the uh, the risk due to criminalization by the state and violence by comp uh, competitors. Uh, we produce us propose two distinctions to classify the way in which drug trafficking is governed. 
uh, on the one hand, the source of the coercive power either is from the state or from armed groups or a combination of both. And uh, on the other hand, where or, uh, or not it involves social power. And later I describe what is uh, social power, which is basically authority uh, over the population. And uh, uh, we apply this distinction to free Colombian case in Tumaco, Medellin, and Cartagena. Maybe I, I'm not going to have too much time to explain the case, but I, I, I want to proceed uh, to explain the conceptual part of the uh, of the argument. Uh, and if we if I have time, I'm going to apply the concepts to the to this case uh, deeper. Okay. Uh, this case describes different forms of government drug trafficking and different implications in the governance uh, of, of communities. These are uh, different places in the uh, of Colombia. And the results show clear pattern of concentration of power, uh, go, both governance, both criminal and social, or production operation, and, and some trace operation. I mean, there is governance in the drug retailing sales. Uh, trade, the, the, the government of trade is more difficult and is more and, and like, like an open and, and free uh, market. Uh, methods, uh, this is mainly con conceptualization work. Uh, we use secondary sources and interview and field works. Uh, 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 we argue that drug trafficking governance exists when organization or a set of organizations enforce property and participation rights, market condition and protection to business participants. An initial distinction is the extent to which drug trafficking operations occur with or without governance. This is a continuum. Uh, uh, we cannot say that there is there is no governance or there is governance. It is a, a, a continuum. Um, to some extent, uh, uh, there is organization and for property and participation, right? But there's, uh, uh, there is also a space for um, for free tra transactions, uh, there is imposition of market condition, but again, uh, not all the conditions are imposed by, by a set of organizations. And also there is a protection, but protection, uh, there is an open field uh, uh, for, uh, not pro no, for the organization to not to be protected and they have to rely on clandestinity. Uh, on under profile in order to avoid uh, prosecution from the authorities. The authorities. Uh, when governance exists, we propose two distinction to classify the force of governance, the source of power, and the, if there is social power uh, involved. Uh, the first distinction: uh, the source of power in drug trafficking is an essentially a coercive one. It's used by coercion. It can came from the, it can come from the state authorities, politicians, and public officials at different level of governance. Uh, we propose three instances of uh, of power from authorities. One is bribery, is the most basic one. The drug trafficker pay a bribe to allow their operations. Uh, the second is they pay to for cooperation against competitors. And the third one, uh, which involve more uh, power on, on the business by the authorities, is the control of the business by politicians and the state authorities. And we have the case of Noriega in Panama, which he controlled uh, the drug trafficking. By the way, there is a, a good book now of, of this drug lord from Colombia, Carlos Leder. And he's playing a lot how uh, the operation of drug trafficking worked in in Panama during the late during the eighties and uh, uh, during the eighties. Uh, and I think I uh, uh, have a lot of to tell so uh, to sociologists and criminologists uh, uh, in studying drug trafficking and power. Um, the power also can, can can come from different types of armed organizations. I, I I propose four here, uh, which are present in Colombia, but there are a lot of more. Uh, there are there are gangs which are highly territorialized. There are mafia, 
which are territorial, but also uh, able to control long distance trans transactions. Again, uh, they specialize mainly in, in drugs, uh, uh, the, the, cell, the drug retailing sales of drugs, micro trafficking. And uh, they sell drugs directly to the users. Uh, but mafia, uh, they, they are able to control the uh, trade of drugs in long distance and in large uh, uh, amounts. There are also private armies, uh, warlords. Uh, we can find uh, in Mexico and, and Colombia, in, in, in Latin America. And there are also insurgency, uh, revolutionary armies. Um, in Latin America, I think only in Colombia, we, we can find now cases of revolutionary armies involved in, involved in drug traffic. But as we are going to see, uh, the, the previous insurgencies are becoming uh, like warlords. They are acting more like warlords. They, they are not planning a, a social uh, revolution. And a cartel is basically a combination of the three first one. I mean, a cartel is composed by gangs. They have territorial uh, control in, in big city neighborhoods. They also have land mafias, and they also pro have private armies, which is the case of Mexico. Um, to some extent, uh, this is the case of, uh, of autodefensa gaitanistas in, in, uh, in, in, in Colombia. And uh, um, by the way, uh, Escobar uh, had the idea to create a guerrilla in Colombia. So he had the uh, he almost have uh, the four types of of, organiz of organizations. The second distinction is the existence of social power. And uh, we argue that social power exists if the governance of drug trafficking is related to decisions about who are the authorities in society. The more the influence on the decision who governs, the more the social uh, power. However, governing society is far more complex than governing drug trafficking. Social power is not conceived just to govern drug trafficking. And this is the game for the presidents. Um, and there was the case of Ernesto Samper in Colombia, uh, who he admitted that his presidential campaign received uh, money from Cali Cartel. But we cannot say that he did that uh, in order to control drug trafficking. He only did that to offer uh, protection. Of course, he won the presidential uh, uh, election uh, because of that money. But uh, my point is, uh, we cannot reduce uh, the, the, the the other authority or the authority selected by the money of drug trafficking uh, just uh, to the purpose of ruling of drug trafficking. Uh, ruling society is far more complex than ruling drug uh, trafficking. Even the armed organizations uh, that the that rule societies. Um, there is a, there are all, uh, other purposes just to accumulate resources and, um, and wealth uh, from drug trafficking. They have to uh, to think and to invest a lot of uh, resources and energies, uh, planning and uh, uh, governing uh, uh, society. Uh, in the case of the state authority. Payment to politicians and public office, of, 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 officials uh, for not repressing drug trafficking operation do not involve social power by itself. Only if this payment involves the selection of political class that governs society through election, for, in, for example, and the appointment of authorities to prosecute drug trafficking, there is a, we argue that there is a, a social power. And in, in other cases, it's just bribe, uh, corruption. This is an example of social power. This guy is Salvador Mancuso. He was a warlord from Colombia. He controlled an army of one, of more than 1,000 uh, soldiers. And, and, and there was a, an article on the newspaper, and, and, uh, uh, and this article said that Mancuso even said that the AUC commanders, which, which, which was the main paramilitary group in Colombia, had no influence to fire or promote officers according to their interests. He mentioned an episode in which General Ramirez, General Ramirez was involved. He recounted that the colonel named Ivan Velasquez was removed from his post 
on order from Carlos Castaño. Carlos Castaño was the uh, the maximum commander of the AUC. The top boss of the AUC allegedly asked General Ramirez to remove the office, and according to Mancuso, this was done. So and there is social power here because there is a, they define who act as an authority over a, a society. In the case of armed organization, violence confrontation limited to bodyguard and hitman to Goberto traffic do not involve social power. I mean, uh, vendettas by itself and do not involve social uh, power. Only violence by armed organization involve the partial or the total governance of the population in the territory where drug trafficking occurs, uh, we say there is social uh, power. And where power, social, social power exists, transaction between criminal organization and state authorities involve more complex issues than protection of drug traffic. Corruption, um, bribery of authority, involve protection to govern society. And that is a big difference with a, a lot of cases of corruption in, in, uh, in Europe and, or in the United States. I mean, their corruption is paid and uh, drug trafficking is not prosecuted. In the case of Colombia or Mexico, or Mexico uh, bribe is paid in order to let an armed organization to rule over a society, uh, which is a, a different uh, kind of, 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 tra of transaction. Uh, the first one is mainly an economic one or a criminal one, and the second one is political one. It's paying to be the authority to uh, um, of, of of a part of of, of society. Um, typically, arranging and confrontation occur to define the boundaries of governance between criminals and the state. Uh, basically, they are defining the governance institutions, and it occurs. Uh, it tends to occur in. In, in a kind of oligopoly of coercion. Um, the armed organization, uh, criminal armed organization, they rule some aspects of society, some space, some transaction, and in, in a parallel way, the state uh, uh, does the, uh, does the, uh, the same. And they have to uh, arrange, uh, using confrontation also, uh, the boundaries of the institution. Who we, which institution works on, on society. And this happened basically because uh, these are not weak states. I mean, there is a, there are, uh, there is a lot of case of strong central uh, states uh, that have a problem of authority in, in, the peri in peripheral uh, areas. Here I, I put some examples. Um, to uh, to our theory on drug traffic and governance. Uh, this is a uh, two by two square. Uh, we can see when there is social power and uh, when there is sort of coercion. When there is no social power and the main sort of coercion in the state, uh, governance of drug trafficking uh, relies on just bribe of state authorities. That is a low level of, uh, of governance. Uh, when there is no social power and there is armed organization, uh, it occurs violence, but hitman and body wars. So um, it's a violent environment, but uh, the, the people, uh, common people and civilians are not ruled by armed or by criminal organization. Uh, when there is social power uh, and the state is involved, election of politician and appointment of public official is determined, determined uh, into grand extent by drug trafficking resources. Um, when there is social power and armed organization, um, control of drug trafficking involves authorities over the community. Uh, in practice, uh, what happens is that in a, in, a, in a same country, all of these cases may happen. For instance, in Bogota, in Colombia, there is just bribe of state authorities. But if we go over to Maco, we are going to see Maco, there is control of drug tra uh, control of drug traffic involves authorities over community, but also election of officials, um, of politicians, and appointment of public officials is, is influenced by the resource of drug trafficking. So these are ideal uh, ideal ties that occurs in the same uh, country. Uh, and here uh, I, hope I have spent fifteen minutes, so. Uh, Basically, I use the, these three cases, Cartagena, Medellin, and Tumac. 
This is a map of the demography of Colombia and the main routes. And you can see Tumaco is an isolated region and Medellin and Cartagena are big cities. Medellin is important because for laundering and Cartagena has a, a, a port. Uh, and Tumaco, uh, look, is mainly a rural area and around Tumaco, and you can see here in the, in the mouth, uh, in Tumaco, there is a lot of coca growth. So, uh, and there is also la laboratories there. So this is a point uh, of the mainly, uh, this is a dispatch center. A lot of uh, semi-submergible and go fast. Uh, you can see the picture here of uh, semi-submergible, like a submarine. Uh, there is a lot of transportation of cocaine to Mexico and Central uh, America. And uh, here, uh, an army is needed to control the territory. And there are mainly two, uh, two armies, uh, the ENC and Nueva Italia. They are dissident for the, for the former guerrilla, the, uh, the FARC. Um, uh, here is a center mainly of production. So uh, there is a, a strict control on coca farmers, base producer, uh, coca base producer, and coca in laboratory and shipping points and trafficking uh, corridors. In Medellin, uh, here is almost a monopoly of coercion by uh, armed groups. And uh, as I told you, uh, there is a lot of influence in the selection of civil authorities, mainly local politicians. Um, sometimes like members of the National Army are not uh, corrupted. Um, this is the case of Medellin. Because Medellin is the second city of, uh, of Colombia. It has a, a, a strong state presence, high economic development, and demographically concentrated. There is a lack of violence uh, on drone traffic and organized crime. And uh, remember Pablo uh, Escobar. Um, now there is a lot of, of combos or gangs. This is a map of criminal uh, governance by combos. Each point is a combo. And you can see here that 70% uh, of the city is ruled in, in to a more or lesser extent by these combos. But these combos are not now involved in international drug trafficking. You can traffic drugs in Medellin and you don't have to pay them. Uh, it's enough, uh, uh, to, uh, you have to, it's better to pay the, the, to the local authorities. In fact, uh, the organized crime of Medellin uh, is not involved in money laundering. Uh, in this picture, you can see the main buildings of the of the state in Medellin. This is the governor and the mayor office. And in front of here, uh, you can going to find a lot of mall uh, store centers. And these store centers, uh, that this mall was built by smugglers, and they are money launderers. And they don't have to pay to the organized crime in the city. They pay to the police. They pay to the uh, uh, to the to the attorney uh, office, and they receive a, a protection to launder money. We cannot say the, here that is a, there is a government. There is only bribe. So it is uh, different than the case of of, of the uh, of, of the combos in the poor neighborhoods in Medellin. Uh, I don't have time to present uh, Cartagena, but I would like to focus on the uh, conclusions. Uh, first conclusion is that governance of drug trafficking varies substantially in Colombia. The governance of drug trafficking by armed organization concentrates on production and retail trade, both demand social power, and it occurs in peripheral areas. Like international trade operators, participate in a relatively free market. And you can find in, uh, in the news, uh, case of uh, drug traffickers from Albania, from Holland, uh, from Italy, a lot of places of the world coming to Medellin to buy drugs. Um, the main constraint is to secure a cocaine supplier in some peripheral uh, region, a private army, because production is, is concentrated in peripheral areas and those are controlled by uh, private armies. And laundry demands a lot of protection from the state, but hardly we can speak of organization that govern uh, it. Well, uh, that's all. I think I only spend uh, 20 minutes.
Yeah, fantastic. Not sure. Okay. Thank you so much, Gustavo, also uh, for being so good in time. Thank you so much. Uh, well, it's a, a fascinating presentation, and I must confess I was intrigued by uh, when the, the you know the the, the webinar was uh, conceived and Zora um, suggested to organize the webinar. I was intrigued by the word governance, especially applied to the drug trafficking, because it's not only because it's uh, it's obviously the the main focus of the the working group I lead. So this is our main uh, our uh, own main uh, research concerns, but also because. Uh, Going back to my uh, research, the research I was doing when I was younger in and in field working in Colombia, uh, I was uh, exploring exactly uh, the way through which a governance of drug trafficking uh, was existing, and uh, it, it is nice to see that these uh, there is a theory of uh, uh, um, of uh, drug trafficking governance, and that there is more room for research. So it would be nice to to explore more and more. Uh, so thank you so much. And obviously, I forgot before uh, to uh, mention that uh, um, uh, should you already have some comments or questions, you can uh, uh, immediately uh, type in the chat. Then there will be uh, time at the end for a, a discussion. But if you want already to, to write, to type something in, in the chat, please feel free. And then we collect everything at, at the end. Uh, OK, Zora, now um, I give you the floor. Perfect. So if you can uh, hear me all right and see everything, I'm just going to start Perfect. straight ahead so that we don't waste any time. Um, so I'm going to speak about uh, not the governance of uh, the cocaine trade and drug trade, but I'm looking at, uh, at a different, but you will see then in just a few minutes how it is related to governance in the end as well. I'm going to look at uh, how violence is playing a role in uh, cooperation in the drug trade or in criminal markets more generally. And I thought that it would be a good idea to start uh, with a concrete empirical example. What you can uh, see here, what you can read here on this slide, is a conversation that was intercepted by the Italian police uh, in Calabria, in the very south of Italy. And the context behind this uh, conversation, in which someone is suggesting to organize an incursion like ISIS, we go and take bombs and place them somewhere. So this conversation uh, comes into being because a shipment of drugs, of cocaine particularly, yeah was supposed to arrive in the port of uh, Gioia Tauro and when the port extraction team, so port operators which were supposed to retrieve the drugs, opened the container, they didn't find anything. And now the mafia clan, which has ordered and paid for the drugs in advance, uh, is left without any drugs. And they, they are suspicious of the port operators. So they think that the people in the port have just stolen all the drugs and want now to punish them with placing bombs somewhere. How exactly this punishment is working out is unclear. Let me give you another example. We are speaking about the same uh, clan. We are speaking yet again about the problem that comes up in a drug transaction, so in an exchange of cocaine. And in this case, Laura, something Laura, goes wrong with... Excuse me. Um, we are just uh, uh, looking at the same slide or the initial one, and it's not making any slideshow. So uh, are you... Okay, no, no, this no. is weird. But... Yeah, okay, but can you move to a slideshow so we can we can have a look? Um, can you see the second slide now with the intercept? Oh, we can see the third one now. This is really weird. Yeah, this is Let the second. Me... But now you can't the second see one. Mm -hmm. Let me try again. Um, I'm just now sharing the entire screen, so maybe this makes it easier. So when I go in full view, now can you see it full screen? Yes. Yeah. And this is the first And now one. can you see the second one? Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So it this was the work. ISIS one that, yes? No, I just said uh, it should work now. <laughs> Okay, so now you should be seeing a slide with an intercept mentioning ISIS. Yes, we do, yeah. Okay, perfect. So 
let us um, continue where we stopped, which is here in the second uh, empirical example that I briefly wanted to, to give you in which a transaction goes wrong, someone is not paying for the drugs, and uh, in this case it's the son of the mafia boss which wants to kill this person called Girolamo, I will kill him, he says, I will kill him, we are all going to kill each other. Now, this doesn't sound very uh, surprising uh, to many of us. Uh, we are in a criminal environment. Uh, we are in an environment in which uh, a lot of money is involved. And we expect these actors, which are kind of experts in the use of violence, among other things, to actually use violence and to especially use the threat of violence. And in fact, Violence in the drug trade is a topic that has been widely studied. Um, it has been argued by some that it is kind of almost omnipresent or an integral part of illegal markets as a cultural expressive tool. The value might be even in its irrationality. Uh, the argument being that sometimes if I use violence in an irrational way when it is not expected, then I scare my opponent to the point that I'm actually going to be more respected than otherwise. And also very interesting element of criminal markets generally, but this starts uh, very often being a problem within uh, drug markets, is the cycles of violence which originate um, when, for example, drugs are stolen. And then there's retaliation, retaliation escalates, and kind of uh, putting a stop to these cycles of violence and revenge becomes incredibly difficult. And that is why we are actually not so surprised uh, when we talk about violence within the drug trade. And that's actually also what inspired a little little bit uh, initially at least um, this uh, study trying to understand um, violence but what we try to understand is actually whether um, whether those authors that within the literature still consist in a minority uh, and that argue that there are in fact incentives to economize the use of violence so that are going a little bit against this uh, idea that violence is pervasive and it's omnipresent within illegal markets and say that in fact violence is an instrumental value and is only uh, strategically used uh, to a certain extent in specific context and therefore what we observe in, um, in reality is sometimes peaceful context or segments of illegal markets that can be peaceful and that has been observed for example by by Reuter and uh, his colleagues in uh, a study of the drug trade in Europe, but also within Latin America, where we're very used to see very violent um, um, scenarios and environments. Uh, in fact, for example, um, in Bolivia, we do see that um, the uh, cocaine industry is at least relatively um, peaceful. So now the question becomes really, when is it that we see the use of violence and where is it that we do not see the use of violence? And so the idea was behind this study to try to bring together against this kind of opposing views and trying to explain why, in a sense, they're both right and in a sense they're both wrong. So they both kind of fit uh, within our empirical observations. And so we ask three main questions. Um, we started first with, um, is the drug trade riddled with incidents? So how often do we see things going wrong in the drug trade? Uh, if then uh, this is the case that we do observe incidents, uh, are they then leading to disputes, that is disagreements or fights of some sorts between the parties involved in the incident and in the transaction? And if that is the case, if we do have a dispute, how is this dispute solved? Uh, the question on the background being, is it solved? by violence or by the threat of violence. Uh, to answer these questions, we uh, use an indictment of an Italian um, operation uh, against a drug trafficking network, which is kind of, um, the core is in Calabria around a mafia clan, but it stretches across whole of Europe, uh, including Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands, and it includes transaction with Latin America. It's a very, very extensive indictment, thousands and thousands of pages, which cover events between 2015 and 18. Um, we produced two data sets, one on transactions and one on actors, which in an incredible way just produced 81 transactions and 81 actors. That's an incredible coincidence. We would have very much liked it not to be the case because it looks very weird, but obviously, uh, needless to say, it's not that each transaction relates to one actor, quite the opposite, but we just, by coincidence, get the same number of transactions and actors. Uh, we coded uh, each transaction 
and we coded some characteristics of the actors as well. And uh, we then used descriptive statistics and qualitative analysis to come up with the paper that I'm presenting today. I don't want to say much more on the methods because I'd like to go to the content of it and to give you a little bit of a sense of what, what we found so far. Um, in the 81 transactions, we are looking at very large quantities, usually of cocaine, which make up 82% uh, of the quantity uh, in all of the transactions and 98% of value. We also have a few, um, a few uh, transactions looking at cannabis and synthetic drugs, but they're really not, uh, not many. We are speaking about quite some drugs, 3,000 kilos of drugs that have been exchanged or um, the access in the database tried to exchange. We will see that not all of the transactions actually uh, were successful. Um, large quantities means also high value exchanges. So we have a minimum value of around 4,000 euros, a maximum value of 5.1 million euros in cocaine. We will see that that transaction does not uh, go well in the end, but even the average and median value are quite high. So generally high value exchanges. So we are situated basically in, in the upper level, wholesale level of the cocaine uh, trade. And what we have, and this is really interesting, is uh, quite a wide geographic span. We do have extra European transactions. We have transactions that take place within Europe, then within Italy and within Calabria. So there's quite some um, uh, variance when we look at geography, and this will become uh, quite important in our analysis. We will see just in a second. Uh, when we look at actors, we see that 94% are male. Uh, some of the women, in fact, uh, have quite interesting roles, but I don't have the time to get into that uh, right now. We are between uh, around 44, 43 um, uh, years of age, and uh, we have uh, in the data set roughly 30% of the actors that we would uh, categorize as mafia affiliates. This is not... Uh, uh, any kind of indication of culpability or legal indication. And the interesting thing here is that we have um, at least um, six clusters. The Mafia clan sits in, um, in Calabria, uh, but then we have a logistics group in uh, Germany, uh, one in Napoli in Italy. Uh, then we have a broker, a uh, single person, but has a group around himself in Belgium. Uh, then we have money laundering operations in Germany as well, and uh, another logistics uh, group that specializes in port extraction in, uh, in Calabria. This is a very simplified um, version of it. There are other groups, but this is kind of just to give a very simplified idea of what is the type of operation and the, uh, that we are uh, looking at. So what are the results in terms of use of violence? Well, we see first thing, um, if we go back to the question we asked, we see that incidents and disputes are common in the drug trade. So uh, we do have quite a few uh, incidents, roughly half of the transactions actually got complications. Uh, however, what we see is that the use of violence is not omnipresent, is not actually uh, there at all. So many incidents never developed into disputes. No dispute was solved with violence. And several disputes, in fact, were never solved at all. So you can see here just a quick uh, overview of the reasons of incidents. Police seizure is the one that I expected to be there. I mean, we're looking at an indictment. Obviously, we're going to have the seizures in there. Uh, no impartial payments uh, are um, the second most common reason for incidents. And what I didn't really expect was this trust, which came up completely unrelated to any transaction, but just a general sentiment of distrust due to uh, completely unrelated issues that the actors had one with another. And so that led to the entire operation to fail. And in those cases, in fact, even quite some money not to be made as a result of it. So to have the, the, a few numbers here, we have an incidents in 46% of the transactions, half of the incidents developed into a dispute. This is not much. Think about the fact it is an incident and there's a lot of money that is at stake. And actually only half of them even developed into a fight, into a conflict, into a discussion even. And violence was threatened only seven times and it was never used. So we, we were kind of a bit puzzled by it. And um, we, we started to, to try to make sense of it. And 
uh, we asked why is there no violence and I think there is two dimensions that kind of can give us yes there are two dimensions that uh, can uh, give us an idea of why that is and one is when we look uh, at trade as opposed to governance scenarios. And the other one is when we look within trade at long versus short distance uh, as being relevant to explain the absence or likelihood, uh, let's put it that way, of uh, violence or threats of violence being used. So what we see of the geography of violence is that the extra European transactions that we have in our uh, data set are the most numerous. They account for most incidents and disputes, but violence was threatened only once. While the transactions within Calabria, they are the least numerous, we, have, we only have a few, they give rise to less incidents, less disputes, but every dispute involves the threat of violence. So this is really interesting for us because there's a very clear uh, geography or geographical element that comes up in the distribution of uh, threat of violence, but also in the distribution of uh, emergence of disputes. So why is there no violence in trade? Well, first of all, because trade is not governance. Now, uh, what Gustavo, for example, was talking about, which is also this, this very strong territorial element and localized element, this is not available in trade. So within governance, we do see that, for example, what also Gustavo was mentioning, the element of coercion, um, in, in, in this context, the use of violence has a completely different, well, benefit, but also cost. Uh, violence is a key ingredient in any zero-sum game, while trade is completely set up in a different way. When we look at trade, especially when we look at trade, which is not the retail level, right? So we are in the wholesale long distance trade, and I will come back to it in a second. So if we look at trade, we are speaking about what authors have called action sets or uh, long and short term patterns of cooperation. We are in a completely different dimension, uh, which is kind of removed, or at least in this element, and I think Emilia will talk a little bit more about that in this, in, in this moment, in the very segment that we are looking at right now, it is removed from that sense of, um, of, of territoriality. And in a positive sum game, which is an, a game of exchange, a game of trade, violence can even be counterproductive, uh, and it certainly is more costly. So why is there no violence in long distance trade? Well, it's, it's actually quite easy and obvious. Feasibility plays an important role. Long distance increases the cost of violence to the point that sometimes its use becomes impractical. Uh, is the Calabrian mafioso going to take a plane uh, if the drug does not arrive and he is thinking that his counterpart in Colombia has cheated on him? What is he going to do? Is he going to take a plane? fly to Bogota, uh, then uh, change, go to Medellin, find the guy who sold him the drugs, and then do what? It's impractical, and the cost is extremely high, even if it would be practical to do it. And that basically leads to the really important problem here, and the dimension here, the me mechanism that really explains it, which is if a threat is not feasible, well, then it lacks credibility. So the cost of the threat, the less credible is its execution. And this actually plays um, uh, within a wider context context of uncertainty. Um, what, what long distances really do is that they increase the cost of monitoring to the point that establishing culpability is impossible or results in a very lengthy process. So not only um, my threat is pretty impractical, has a high cost, and therefore is not credible, but I also am not uh, sure about who should I even threat who should I even punish when things go wrong? And just establishing who that is, is a lengthy process. Now, um, how is cooperation sustained then in, um, in this scenario? Well, by trust substitution or trust building mechanisms, financial incentives, insurance, hostage exchange, repeated interaction, proof sometimes is asked, although um, it's, not, uh, it's not a very clever thing to, to share proof. Proof, for example, in terms of pictures being taken of the drugs being, uh, being shipped. Um, or for example, there was a request of putting on a camera when extracting the drugs from the container that was then um, uh, basically resisted by the port uh, operators that didn't want obviously to have them extracting cocaine on camera for the police to be able to, to then seize whenever they want and using court against them. But what was really interesting is that in fact, we saw that uh, many of the disputes were just solved by, uh, I call it goodwill, 
Uh, but basically just a sign that one um, was kind of trying to uh, make good what was going wrong. An apology, I'm sorry, I didn't think of it, or next time I'll do better, or I really promise you I will be paying much quicker next time. And this would be already enough actually to just move on and continue trading. And in fact, um, while this might sound surprising, uh, it's, it's just in the sheer numbers that are related to this type of trade. So what is really um, unproductive for both parties in the transaction is basically when trade stops. So the stopping of the trade is the least favorable option for both parties. And as we know, because of uncertainty, there is a lengthy process of basically trying to even figure out what went wrong, who was at fault, and how we're going to solve this. In fact, while we are engaging in this discussion, we are not trading. And not trading means losing quite a lot of money. And so basically, uh, what we see is that many of these disputes actually don't even get solved at all, and the train continues just as such. Now, what is, what is a big caveat of this study? This is an exploratory study. Um, it is one indictment that looks at one uh, trafficking network. So it does not follow, and this is not what I want to say, that violence is never used. What I want to say is that there is a variance in the use of violence and that we need to understand what are the mechanisms that lead to violence as opposed to the mechanism that lead to cooperation without violence, because this is really what we are actually ultimately interested in, in, in trying to identify uh, violence and limit violence. And so the next question comes, under what conditions is the use of violence conducive um, or necessary for cooperation? And we're trying to answer this this question in uh, in an upcoming paper uh, with a colleague of mine who is uh, an economist. So we're trying exactly <clears throat> to model and 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 abstract and conceptualize um, a, a theory that is uh, uh, able to explain, at least with all its limitation, uh, under which conditions we see peace or war in uh, drug markets. And this is actually part of. Um, a series of uh, articles uh, that we are producing um, currently on the on the drug markets. So I'm working on another paper on criminal incompetence in drug markets. So how the incompetence on, of criminals is affecting the efficiency of drug markets. Is it even relevant? Uh, decision making patterns in drug markets that I'm uh, working with Emilia and uh, what you've heard about the governance of trade and production in the Colombian cocaine industry. Uh, there will be a few papers about that hopefully uh, with the work with uh, Gustavo. So thank you everyone. And I hope I kept my, uh, my time and I'm happy to now hand over to um, Emilia. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Zora. Um, yeah, okay, <laughs> you stayed in time. So thank you so much for this. And also uh, I see that there is a bunch of uh, uh, investigation of several components of this gov governance of uh, drug trafficking. So we look forward to new webinars at this point. Maybe we can involve uh, also Federico and, and other colleagues uh, in, uh, in, uh, in our discussions as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Emilia, would you like to continue? You have the floor. Thank you so much. I'm going to try and share my screen. Just a sec. Okay. Are you able to see this? Yes. Yes. Please go ahead. Okay. Oh. Okay, um, so I don't know what happened, but uh, I should work now. So hi everyone, um, thank you so much Gustav and Zora for the presentations. They were really, really interesting. It was great to hear your work again. Um, so uh, I'm really happy to be here today. And what I'm gonna focus um, is mainly the movement of drugs um, across transit spaces through the specific case of Honduras. So a very understudied topic in a very understudied country. So 
what we um, what we know is that the the movement of illicit commodities uh, such as drugs or contraband goods uh, from a place of departure to a destination is commonly understood as an illicit flow. Uh, specifically for drug flows, the existing literature tends to focus on source countries and destination countries, leaving um, transit countries um, underexplored or just in general transit spaces. Um, especially, obviously, since it's harder to pin down geographically the movement of illicit commodities, this has very much resulted in, in a scarcity of accounts on, on transit spaces and has also contributed in a way in um, a general inadequacy in, in describing illicit flows. In fact, we see that uh, conventional academic, uh, but also institutional discourses, they tend to depict illicit flows as um, invisible, as really fluid, ephemeral and simple, but at the same time, uh, sort of very obscure arrows on, on a map, so just representing all illicit object, objects in, in motion. Um, this is obviously uh, this obviously stems from um, the fact that it's much easier to sort of um, detect something whose location is fixed, um, such as coca crops, for example, and that therefore can't really be moved or can't be concealed in the same way as illicit goods uh, in transit can. Um, until now, also the, the existing literature on drug flows has mostly shown that when in transit, drugs are usually hidden in spaces such as containers and trucks and often mingled with legitimate goods or as focused on the routes and, and on the quantities of these goods. Eventually, um, however, um, there is still a scarcity of accounts in the illicit economies and also in the organized crime literature focusing on the movement of illicit commodities as the primary subject of analysis. And more importantly, there is also um, very limited research on the impact that illicit drug flows have on the territories that they tra traverse despite just being passing by. And this raises the question of how uh, really an, an activity that uh, is usually considered as um, transient, as temporary, such as drug trafficking, can become rooted in, in transit areas. So to delve into this paradox and answer my, my research question, I rely uh, on the case of Honduras as a case study and uh, why Honduras. So Honduras, um, to give you a little bit of context, is uh, believed to be a transit hub for cocaine trafficking since the 1970s, um, especially for what concerns US bound cocaine and, and its uh, precursor chemicals. And in the last two decades, um, the transit of drugs across the, the country has really grown substantially. And it reached the peak, for example, in 2012, when according to, to US government estimates, uh, to give you sort of an idea of the, of the magnitude of the trade across the country, 75% of cocaine smuggling flights leaving South America would first land in Honduras to then go to the US. And the country is extremely small if also we compare it, for example, to Mexico, which is another big um, transit country, right? So this is believed to be um, the, the result of a series of factors. Honduras is obviously a very strategic uh, location. It's situated between uh, producing countries in South America and destination country, mainly the, the United States. But its importance in drug trafficking also stems from, uh, for example, an increasing demand from destination countries, but also other factors such as um, the influence that the war on drugs had, especially on Colombia and Mexico, uh, that in the last few decades, it has really redirected the, the cocaine transit route to Central America. And also very much we see um, an involvement often of uh, local corrupt networks that facilitate the traffic. Today, current estimations are a bit lower compared to the ones of uh, 2012, but the country still remains an, an important um, transit hub for cocaine trafficking in the Americas. And especially in recent years, um, Honduras drug traffickers have received growing regional attention, especially with the, the approval of the, um, the extradition law for drug trafficking charges between Honduras and the US in 2012. And the trials that have been held until now um, 
So within the last decade in the US of Honduran drug Honduran nationals involved in drug trafficking have showcased really the, the crucial role of, of transit spaces within global drug markets, but also, um, and more importantly in the sense, the embeddedness of, of drug trafficking in the country. So to delve into this paradox and, and more in general into my, my research question, so of how illicit drug flows really can become embedded into the, the territorial realities of transit spaces despite just being passing through, I have um, conducted a qualitative analysis of publicly available uh, official judicial documents of um, a series of United States district courts uh, that date from 2015 to 2022. Uh, among the documents, there are, for example, indictments, sentences, sentencing memorandums, trial testimonies, and these concern the alleged involvement of Honduran nationals in drug trafficking and, and money laundering activities in the country. And I created a database with 42 official um, judicial court documents concerning um, drug trafficking and money laundering activities. And these documents are available for public consultation, which makes them very transparent. And they were retrieved from a series of sources, which are mainly the United States Department of Justice web website, uh, Inside Crime, uh, but also large repositories of federal courts, um, texts and documents and cases, for example, Docket Bird or uh, Case Tax. And information was then triangulated and cross-checked with uh, five semi-structured interviews I held online in 2021 with experts on drug trafficking in the country that are both Honduran nationals and not, and among which we find journalists, practitioners, scholars, and many of which had carried out extensive fieldwork in the, in the country in the preceding years, which uh, obviously there are limitations, right, to, to um to these, uh, these methods, especially the fact that, for example, relying so much on court documents also means that we very much have um, sort of the um, the view of um, of in this case uh, the the U.S. Uh, judges and the U.S. defense lawyers uh, and also as as the the trials were held specifically in the United States it's also I guess essential to acknowledge the potential influence in uh, of all the contextual factors that uh, might have had on on the testimonies. And for what concerns the interviews, I only use them as, as contextual knowledge, so to really triangulate the data, um, but also it's, it needs to be acknowledged the, the subjectivity of the individual perspective, which I tried to um, mitigate by carefully selecting participants and, and really trying just to, to triangulate data. Um, so for what concerns, oh, sorry, okay. So um, this takes us to our foundings, right? Uh, so um, how the transit of cocaine works in Honduras is that the drugs usually enter the country via sea or air, and maritime routes usually encompass uh, boats leaving from the Venezuelan or Colombian uh, border to then reach the country's Caribbean coast, uh, where ports such as Puerto Cortes, Puerto Lempira, and La Ceiba are. And then air routes, on the other hand, mostly see private planes coming from Venezuela and Colombia, landing in one of the multiple illegal airstrips in the country. So um, once the drugs reach the country, Honduran drug trafficking groups, often referred to as transportistas, are in charge of receiving, storing, and transporting the large-scale drug loads across the country. And in order to be moved across the country, obviously, drug shipments need first the infrastructures in order to, to be received. And along the rural and often remote areas of Honduras, drug traffickers, what they do is that they often build and thus produce um, the infrastructures or try and negotiate access to these in, in some cases to be able to enable the movement of cocaine across the country. And this is the case, for example, um, as we see of the construction of illegal airstrips, which very much abound uh, in the country. Um, and here we see, for example, a screenshot of um, a document for the case of a Honduran national that was sentenced to 30 years in prison um, in the US for conspiring to import cocaine in the country, uh, who, as the document recites, was allegedly found uh, to be involved in the construction of an illegal airstrip near the border with Nicaragua to maintain ties with the, the Sinaloa cartel. 
Okay. Um, and the need to have this sort of need to have um, a secure lending trip is uh, very much recurrent, a very much recurrent theme uh, within the documents analyzed. Um, and that also demonstrate uh, that at the same time also demonstrate the, the importance of uh, exerting control over these infrastructures for drug traffickers. And this is, for example, shown in the screenshot we have here, uh, where the defendant's uh, control over S-scripts uh, is um, clearly stated. Um, and so, uh, obviously, drugs uh, need to um, need fixed infrastructures in order to, to be received, right? But more than that, um, drug traffickers very much need to have access to these infrastructures. So this sometimes, as, as shown uh, from the documents, stems from the fact that they are able to exert and control um, and hold control over this infrastructure. And uh, in other cases, however, access to these spaces um, needs to be um, negotiated. And so this access to movement is something which is very much recurrent and that we see, for example, also um following on with the with the findings so when the so to try and sort of uh follow the um, the movement of the drugs across across the the country um when uh, the drugs reach the country then Honduran drug traffickers or the people working for them are in charge of receiving uh, the drugs and moving them across Honduras and especially in certain areas, um, remote areas of the country, the transit of drugs often encompasses the, um, the involvement of a series of different actors. Um, this is said to be the case, for example, of the Honduran Mosquitia, uh, which is a large rural area in northeastern Honduras, uh, located in the department of Gracias a Dios at the border with um, Nicaragua. And um, the region is believed to be uh, Honduras' most difficult to access region, especially as a result of its uh, geographical features, such as tropical uh, forests and wetlands, and also due to uh, very limited uh, statal investments and infrastructure in infrastructures and, and also in public services throughout the decades. So the region is also believed to be a crucial transit zone for cocaine trafficking directed to the United States. And in the last two decades, it has started to attract increasing national and international attention as multiple illegal airstrips, burnt planes, and coca crops as well, and labs have been found in, in the region. So this has also raised awareness on the fact that um, drug traffickers often employ locals to clear the land, to build airstrips, and also to unload drug cargoes. Um, so this was, for example, uh, an interview I held uh, with the Honduran journalist uh, who carried out extensive fieldwork in the region. Um, and uh, what happens is that, especially as drug trafficking often constitutes uh, one of the few available forms of, of livelihoods uh, for the communities living uh, in the isolated areas uh, where there are very few economic opportunities, infrastructures and also access to, to infrastructure is very poor and, and the state presence is quite limited. Locals are sometimes paid to move the drugs from the plains to small boats and to then transport them via the river or take them to, to the drug labs, as the, um, as the Honduran journalist I interviewed uh, suggests. And um, once the drugs are then loaded into uh, the trucks to be transported via land, cocaine then continues its journey, often passing from hand to hand among various actors. And uh, its transits, however, often requires as well uh, an element of local control, of local territorial control by drug traffickers. And as the following screenshot shows, for example, um, in this case, a drug trafficker had to ask for permission to have a cocaine shipment landing in the territory controlled by a Honduran drug trafficker group called Los Cachiros, which was then authorized. This very much shows that uh, where access to movement and to the infrastructures that facilitate it is, is sort of restricted, it needs to be negotiated. And especially in areas where um, formal authorities often contested and criminal groups manage to, um, in some cases, to impose their own rules over communities, uh, then drug traffickers might negotiate access to movement with other drug traffickers that by um, sort of exerting um, control over strategic points for, for the transit of drugs across the country might have the ability really to enable or to disrupt the drugs movement. And this ability 
Um, so this ability to to sort of enable or disrupt uh, the the drugs journey is also uh, held by state actors in the country, obviously, uh, who in certain cases, however, have been uh, found to um, provide access to the infrastructures and the relations enabling the the drug trade um, uh, to to Honduran drug traffickers. So what we see in this screenshot is the testimony of um, a Honduran drug trafficker, leader of the Cachiros drug trafficking organization, that during the trial of the son of a former president of the country, uh, revealed that the defendant was allegedly an intermediate and a broker between traffickers and formal authorities in Honduras, and was facilitating the negotiation to, to obtain access for the drugs movement across the country. So on a specific occasion, uh, which uh, refers to the screenshot in this slide, uh, the Cachiros drug trafficking organizations needed to move a cocaine shipment via land from a city in the north of the country all the way to, to the west near the border with Guatemala. And once the, the trucks with the, um, with the drugs arrived, the witness, which is one of the leaders of the Cachiros, called uh, allegedly called the, the defendant to meet up who, who joined with three um, SUVs, so big cars, um, with drivers that were wearing a military uniform and the defendant and the witness then left on one of these cars together with the um, cocaine field truck and two more um, cars sort of escorting them. And in the journey, uh, as you can see from the screenshots, they passed through many cities. They uh, used also sirens when needed and also to, to avoid checkpoints. So thanks to, to the defendant's connections with, with formal institutions in the country, the drug traffickers were able to uh, obtain passage for, for the drugs and sort of negotiate access to, to movement with formal authorities in this case. Um, and the same trials documents also show uh, that, for example, police officers um, sometimes were um, allegedly involved in this by, for example, providing drug trafficking groups with information about safe routes to follow the, the movement uh, to, to move the drugs across, the, across Honduras. So on the one hand, um, these cases allow us to see that uh, the movement of cocaine in the country sometimes is enabled by corrupt interruptions, um, as well with state actors. Uh, but on the other hand, they allow, they allow us to, to demonstrate that um, sort of the need for understanding the importance of power relations in, in shaping the movement of illicit drug flows across transit areas, especially as access to, to movement often needs to be negotiated with actors that uh, exert control over certain logistical spaces. So to conclude, um, we have sort of delved into the um, a very much overlooked aspect of the existing accounts on drug flows, which is um, the movement of illicit flows and, and the social relations that uh, enable transit, transit, especially across um, uh, transit countries and transit spaces more in general. And so what I argue um, through the case of Honduras is that drug flows don't just pass through transit spaces, instead uh, they become very much uh, intertwined uh, with them and thus profoundly affect the territorial realities of these areas. And in the case of Honduras, uh, the drugs transit is facilitated by two, by two main components, which are the physical infrastructures and, and the relational processes that enable movement. Um, and there are also a series of actors, both legal and extra legal ones, that uh, enable in different ways the, the transit of drugs uh, across the country through the production, the negotiation to access, uh, and also often the control of the physical infrastructures and relational process allowing movement. Um, this, on the one hand, clashes with um, the perception of illicit flows as ephemeral, as uh, detached from um, sort of uh, societies, uh, especially across transit areas, and as just invisible arrows like uh, just passing through over societies. And on the other hand, uh, it also shows the degree to which exerting governance over logistical space rather than solely on on fixed territories and turfs really becomes fundamental for um, criminal groups operating over transit areas and especially drug trafficking groups. So criminal groups that operate in trade transactions, which is something that has uh, been under addressed in, in the literature on illicit economies and organized crime or in general, and that very much needs further exploration. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Emilia. And this is another fascinating presentation based on a lot of empirical uh, evidence. So you have made a lot of empirical research. And um, so, uh, well, actually, there are many, many uh, questions that are coming to my mind that obviously I won't ask uh, everything to you. Um, uh, because I would like to focus on the very, very basic um, reflections just to put, to, to put on, on the table. And then I, I would prefer to open the floor. Um, and then also I'd like to draw uh, your attention to uh, two basic things that Estefania is sharing many interesting materials in, in the chat which are available. And Anna Sergi unfortunately has to, has to leave, uh, but she asked questions. Uh, I can read questions to at least two questions if I'm not mistaken um, to uh, Gustavo and Zora. So please, if you have a look, but Emilia, obviously you can also have a look um, and the questions. And then if you want to reply later, uh, although Anna is not uh, um, in, uh, in, 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 the, in the room yet, but um, anymore, but she uh, she said that she would like to follow up on, on this. So you can keep in touch with her. Um, so uh, uh, very briefly, uh, it's fascinating to see that uh, there is still a lot of room for research on uh, on the real governance on on uh, drug trafficking. There are many things that you have stressed. So uh, if I have to summarize your uh, uh, three brilliant presentations, I would say that we uh, are uh, we may reflect on on the governance uh, and governance and government. And I refer uh, when. I have to um, uh, to make the premise that I'm a political scientist and international relations. So uh, sorry for this. <laughs> These are the lenses that I'm going to, to share. But I know that in the audience, we have many other scientific background and this is a richness. So when I, I, I refer to governance and government, I see that there is also there's a structure uh, of this uh, uh, um, illicit activity and uh, we are also uh, reflecting on violence, uh, on the uh, violent actors and the use of violence or the non-use of violence or when uh, uh, violence occurs or not. And then obviously the, the roots. So the we may, may say that the basic components of drug trafficking, but um, we have also seen that there are many innovative things to be, to be uh, um, studied and investigated. Uh, so, I will just share a few things uh, for each presentation. Uh, so Gustavo, I, I see that you are using um, a couple of uh, um, concepts that I, I used to, to uh, consider also in my um, previous studies. So the power transactions, first of all, so uh, the, the impact of power transactions in the, in the trafficking uh, and how uh, the, the extent to which uh, this is also related to the uh, to power, um, to the, the political actors, let's say, uh, not only political, but also social actors. And also uh, the notion of criminalization of state, which is uh, uh, obviously super, super interesting. Um, so the, uh, the the first uh, things I would like to, to hear from you is, uh, 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 how do you consider this process of criminalization? Because when I started, criminalization processes. I compared Colombia with other countries with the Western Balkans, <laughs> to tell you the truth. And I studied the criminalization as a, a top-down uh, process and also as a bottom-up. So uh, with this, which is your perspective? Well, you, uh, you see more top-down or more bottom-up. Uh, and then when we see the, the, the presence of violence here, this is a, um, a very organized violence because we, uh, we see uh, lots of uh, non-state armed groups. Uh, so both groups that are making guerrilla uh, and that they are not uh, um, legal, illegal ones, but also some others that like the auto defenses who were uh, at the, the, the core of the self-defense uh, as allowed by state uh, at some point. So um, uh, what about these uh, these relations? I mean, uh, these relations can be considered relations between um, these non-state armed groups uh, and organized crime groups uh, uh, can be considered as a, a real nexus 
uh, as uh, it has been presented in the past, for example, by some criminologists as well, or it's just more uh, linked uh, to uh, what you refer to social power, especially um, in, in the table. In, in the last, uh, uh, the very end, end of your presentation, you used the, 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 the table of social uh, power, political power. Um, when you talk about social power, I see, uh, for example, that we may also envisage some institutions and real institutions that are, I mean, accepted by by people. And if it's, this is the case, uh, the the um, the other key word would be probably legitimization. So we, uh, these are uh, these um, institutions or practices, if they are practices, are accepted because they are uh, there is some kind of. Uh, uh, legitimization of such practices. Uh, and uh, this is also um, linked to relations with political power, again, in the table. Uh, is there any impact on the uh, coming from political regime and specifically from the quality of political regime? Um, I'm asking because I was recently in, in Argentina and Chile once it was studying the uh, relations between um, the the, the uh, existing violence and organized crime activities and uh, the uh, rising illiberalism and illiberal practices. So this is, I'm very curious to hear about uh, the, the case of uh, Colombia. Um, Zora, again, there are many other things I would like to to know, but uh, I probably I will follow up in in another webinar, or uh, we will uh, um, uh, talk in another occasion. Um, Zora, you reminded me um, the literature, which is increasing a little bit in the IR community, but I must confess, on on criminality. Uh, so the fact that, uh, um, according to some empirical research as well, uh, organized crime groups are assuming. Um, a violent character, so they are making use of more and more of violent practices, and this is not just occasional, um, and this is not just functional, but it's more linked to uh, the changing nature of some organized crime groups. So they're becoming uh, violent in their own nature. So I'm. Um, this is a quite controversial literature, but this is increasing. Uh, so when you start, to, you started saying violent violence is only present in a illicit market. Um, I was referring, I was uh, thinking and rethinking on this literature, and also uh, to the fact that um, violence can also become uh, an institution. Um, I mean, institution that is not necessarily uh, something which is rigidly uh, organized, but it can be uh, legitimized as a practice, and it can be part of of something uh, and uh, uh, so it can it can also become a, a rule of the game and uh, especially when when you say that uh, it, it is used for solving disputes obviously if we consider if we look uh, uh, in a broader context a global um uh, uh, political, uh, the global political uh, system, uh, war is a, a way to solve disputes. So violence is a, a way uh, to solve disputes, and we see many uh, much uh, frequently now uh, and often. And so in this sense, from this perspective, violence is allowed. Violence is uh, uh, one of the practices, one of the institutions. So I was thinking about uh, uh, this point, but then uh, looking at the empirical evidences that you presented, so um, uh, the uh, I think that everything can be reversed and, and changed. I mean, if we vi violence is not so omnipresent, and violence is not always used uh, to solve disputes, uh, um, this means that we we have other rules probably. Uh, and so um, what kind of rules uh, and which is the, the, the origins of these, uh, of these rules? Because these are rules of the game, obviously. Uh, and so within the community and within the groups, uh, probably um, we may also uh, consider uh, which is the, the trade-off of many illicit activities. I mean, violence uh, in this case is, uh, uh, it may be just uh, one of the different ways for reaching a goal. And uh, that there are diff they may be different ways to reach a goal. So from this point of view, as for example, war is used, but diplomacy is much better, uh, or uh, mediation, negotiation is much better for states. We may consider the same. So uh, for uh, organized crime groups, there's also the rationality of 
uh, such actor. So um, not necessarily violence is useful. Um, um, yeah, I don't know if it's clear, it's just clear in my mind, but this is just a, um, a list of uh, reflections I had. And also, um, Emilia uh, reminded me uh, the the reflect the, the um, my uh, my other field work in the Balkans because uh, obviously there was a literature on uh, the the Balkan roots and then the Balkan roots were another uh, they they are still relevant as a transit area for many um, goods including many illicit goods, but especially during the war, they were the favorite uh, transit area for uh, for many organized crime groups. Uh, um, so I absolutely agree on the fact that uh, uh, transit space is not just a transit area, there's much more uh, behind, and you uh, brilliantly um, demonstrated with your um, empirical work in a very... Uh, um, how can I say, uh, understudied country, because uh, Honduras is not at the core of all uh, analysis. So it, it, it's um, important to see also how this, uh, uh, these uh, um, understudied transit areas are uh, working. And so the, the, the question is, uh, 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 which other conditions may also allow uh, these areas to be a transit space. I mean, it is not just a transit space, we agree, but uh, we may also see that there are some local conditions. And again, we may go back to the quality of political regimes, so of, of course, to the infrastructures, but we also know that infrastructures are the result of uh, impact and influence of political parties or a private, a private groups or privatization. Um, processes, so which uh, local conditions uh, can be relevant for allowing a transit space to be part of the governance of tra drug trafficking. And if we go broader, uh, far away, we may also um, envisage some kind of regional conditions because maybe Honduras is not, not just linked to local conditions, but they may be some other regional um, uh, conditions that uh, allow this. Um, yeah. Of course, I, I have to stop because I need to be um, <laughs> quick. Uh, so let's see if there are other uh, questions in the chat. Uh, and then we all, obviously anyone can intervene. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Raluca, you just uh, uh, type something. Do you want to, to ask your question or, or make uh, some comments? Of just uh, saying thanks for very interesting insights. It, well, of course, yes, it was not a question, but I mean, if you like, if you want to 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 intervene or anyone in uh, in the audience, then we open now the floor. Otherwise, you can start just answering while maybe the audience is uh, yeah. reflecting. Yes. Yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, Gustavo, do you want to start since the first question was for you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think there is a big transformation in Colombia because there is a separation, a separation between the army groups and the politicians. Um, we have the Medellin cartel, the Cali cartel in the second largest city of Colombia, the second and the third largest city in Colombia. And now we don't have an army group uh, like the Medellin cartel or the, or the, or the Cali cartel. We have armored group but in really peripheral areas like Tumaco. Uh, and there is a lot of corruption. Um, in, 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 in we need to talk about uh, describe the, the Colombian regime. It's like a semi-patrimonialist, uh, low quality democracy, which is quite similar to other Latin American countries. The difference in, in, in Colombia is that in some cases, money launderers. Um, also, political entrepreneurs, uh, I mean, especially in public, uh, in earning public contracts, uh, or also smugglers, uh, they participate in democracy. I mean, they fund campaigns, and in exchange, they obtain protection from the state to do business. Um, but they do, they are not using now violence. They don't have an armed uh, organization. And when they use violence, they use selective violence. Uh, the private armies are located in other areas. And we have a, also a new problem in Colombia, which is a, a lot of organized crime not related to international drug trafficking. 
these are related to the selling uh, drugs in retailing in markets. Um, they are not rich. Uh, they don't have too much economic power, but they have a lot of military power. I mean, they have coercion. And uh, they can rule, they can go there, uh, uh, poor neighborhoods in big cities. And now it's a big problem, but they are not uh, related to to political campaigns or politicians. Um, their, uh, their influence in government is mainly to police, uh, related mainly to police. So the border, uh, the, the transaction of the institution who rule the, uh, the, the, the people living in these communities uh, are made with the police, not with politicians. So it's a big difference than the situation in Syria found 10 or 20 years ago. 20 years ago, there were big armies, uh, there, there were uh, drug traffickers, big drug traffickers were controlled by paramilitary armies and they have to pay. There were links between paramilitaries and politicians at the high girls level. That changed uh, a lot. There is a change in the in the nature of social power involved with drug trafficking, of course. But it's a long answer. So I think it's 12, 30 almost. So I can spend a lot of it. <laughs> and, and I have to leave in 10 minutes. Sorry. I have a class now. <laughs> Okay, thank you. But so if, if in a few minutes you can just reply to Estefania's question about the Clan del Golf, if you like, before you leave. Uh, what is the question? Sorry. Uh, the, uh, she said, uh, how could you describe Clan del Golf relations with politicians and drug trafficking these days? Well, that's a good question because Clan del Golf is growing now. Gaitanistas, uh, they are growing um they now are involved more in, in politics but i think they are related more to local politics and for sure they are i mean i i have seen they doing local politics but not at the national level they don't have uh this relationship as it used to be with the paramilitaries but they are working to to have political legitimacy um now i think they ha they have a uh, Political machinery. I mean, specialists in doing politics, not only specialists in doing coercion. Uh, they have that. Um, uh, I think it's also part of the peace process, peace agreement process. Uh, they know they need to to polit politicize in order to negotiate, uh, if not with this government, with the next government, the following government. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Well, so um, I'm very grateful for your comments, uh, Daniela, because in fact, they all move in the direction in which I am. Um, I'm moving my own research as well. So my background is in political science. And although I've done my DPhil in sociology and, and studying crime, I can really see how um, these two elements kind of like the, polit the political part and the sociological part really both play a role. And definitely, yes, violence is an institution. I consider it to be an institution um, that... Um, institution as in mechanism or practice that allows us to um uh, let's say bring in some certainty within within an environment and to rule and regulate behaviors uh, really uh, within uh, society so this is how i look at um at violence exactly and um that's why i'm fascinated about under which conditions uh, violence becomes an institution that can be used and is meaningful to, in fact, regulate behaviors, practices and exchanges and when this is not the case. And this is really why uh, I'm moving a bit away and it's to answer also to Anna's questions from this cultural understanding of violence, uh, which might be important, is important, has been studied in the literature, but is not what I am studying. Um, I'm really studying this institutional element and, uh, let's say, more political element of violence. I'm also curious about the uh, literature that you mentioned that is kind of indicating how organized crime is becoming more violent, if I understood it in that way, or violent in a different way, because I would be very suspicious about that as well. But so it's really uh, interesting for me. And, and yes, definitely also the diplomatic element of it. Um, when you see war at place, you still see diplomatic channels that uh, under certain conditions work. So this is also interesting to see that um, violence does not exclude, in fact, communication that can still happen between groups because that's what we're really looking at. We're looking at groups um, under conditions of control of territory. We might consider them uh, sort of proto-states 
uh, obviously uh, not complete states or democratic states and liberal states in the way we understand um, modern states today, but definitely in terms of uh, having the monopoly over uh, either a community or um, a territory, we should consider them as states and therefore we investigate them as states and therefore political sciences lenses uh, make absolutely uh, sense. So I'm not going to uh, take any any longer because in a few minutes I will have to leave as well. So I'm handing over to Emilia, maybe if you want to comment. Yes, please hold it. If everyone has to leave, so it's better we we conclude. But please, Emilia, if you have something to react, I mean, to me, if you if you just if you like or the others. Yeah, thank you so much for for your question, um, Daniela. Um, it's re it's re interesting that you mentioned the the Balkans because I do think they probably have some some similar dynamics, and it's also interesting that you mentioned both uh, local and and regional sort of factors that might have uh, influenced the the specific case of Honduras to become a more important transit hub, but in general, you know, uh, transit hubs to to be transit spaces. Um, so I think in the case of Honduras specifically, it's both regional and local dynamics and factors. Uh, so regionally speaking, a very big um, factors that sort of influence the, the importance of, um, of Honduras as a transit hub for cocaine trafficking, especially uh, in the Americas, has been the war on drugs um, that um, through the decades has um, very much through very punitive intervention has sort of um, pushed um, the creation of a new route, which is the one of, of Central America, right? Um, a phenomenon which has been called as, as the balloon effect. So that's surely a dynamic that played a big role in this sense. For local factors, um, we see like political factors, for example. So um, drug the drug trade sort of um, increased in Honduras in the sort of early 2000s. And this has been linked um, to the fact that, for example, in 2009, um, the ex-president of the country was um, ousted and uh, when that happened, um, instability soared, and then drug traffickers obviously had, um, in this instability, they um, it became easier for them. It became easier for them to uh, to deal uh, drugs and be able to transport drugs um, across the country. Uh, but it's also even more local dynamics, I would say. So as we um, as we've seen with the case of the Mosquitia, for example, uh, the fact that there's very limited state state presence in in certain areas of the country. <laughs> Um, has accounted for the fact that eventually there are um, very limited economic opportunities or access to certain public services in, center, in certain areas, um, which then also favors the, the involvement in certain cases of, of local populations, right? Um, so all these factors really do, do account for it. And I, I believe it's a mixture of uh, regional, uh, local, but also global factors in, in, in a sense. All right, thank you. Um, so um, at this point, I think there is a... Yeah, sure. Sorry, 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 sorry to jump in. Um, it's just because I just noticed that um, uh, Estefania is asking um, a question. And so I wanted to just quickly, because maybe I didn't take enough time uh, to explain exactly how I classified uh, incidents and uh, disputes in, in the research. So. Stefania, to you, um, when I um, coded for incidents, I consider an incident to be a situation in which the exchange of drugs does not go according to plan. That means, for example, the police is seizing it or uh, one is not paying for it or paying only partly for it or for any other reason, there is an incident along the exchange. So that's the incident. And if I see an incident, I imagine that then there will be a sort of a discussion around who's at fault, right? So um, if the drugs um, have been seized by the police, I know it's the police, fine. And then I don't have a dispute. And a dispute is this conflict and fighting and discussion around, um, uh, around the incident. Now, sometimes the police is seizing, but is not actually saying it officially. So what happens is that the two parties um, that, that are involved in the exchange start fighting over it because they don't know that the drugs have been seized. So they start um, basically accusing each other that they are at fault. Uh, and that's the reason why the drugs has not arrived. So that is a dispute. Um, so incident is just something goes wrong. And the dispute is, uh, are they fighting over who is at fault 
or uh, are they agreeing and nothing is, is happening? And so this incident is not leading to a dispute. And then uh, as a consequence of the dispute, I'm looking at whether violence is used or not. I hope that's um, clear now. And so we have quite a few incidents. Uh, we have often incidents that never lead to fighting. And then even when they lead to fighting, violence is not used in the data set with the limitations. Yeah, thank you. This is uh, was a very uh, uh, relevant clarifications because also responses and impacts may be different. So it makes sense to uh, to to clarify. So thank you, Zora, and also thank you, Stefania, for uh, for asking questions and for sharing materials. So at this point, uh, I believe that everyone has to go. So I would like to uh, once again thank uh, Zora for uh, taking the lead of this uh, webinar, this initiative, and for presenting and. Thank you, Emilia and Gustavo, for presenting your, your research. So I see that there is a lot of uh, follow-up uh, things that we may uh, organize. So um, I just would like to remind that we are recording this webinar and it will be uh, posted on, on the Glitz, uh, Ghost Glitz uh, YouTube channel. So it will be available there. You are free to... Uh, to use it and to share with your contacts or use it for uh, teaching activities or research activities or whatever you would like to do because it's the sense of cost uh, action is uh, is a sharing and disseminating. Uh, and for those who are not uh, members of the uh, cost action uh, glitz uh, uh, yet yeah, please join and join working group two if you are interested in uh, uh, in this uh, in these topics and so we have uh, uh, lots of interactions uh, and also if you look at the uh, um at our website uh, uh, we you will see also the list of upcoming um activities and webinars uh, so we look forward to uh, welcoming new members so for those of you who are not yet please uh, join Estefania uh, if you are interested please join us and uh, uh, so you can be more involved also for those uh, in in the audience so once again, thank you very much, uh, and uh, uh, we'll see you uh, until next uh, uh, initiative. Thank you, and bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.